on this computer. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, some of the people are right. busy in the day, so it's for here, it's in the middle of the day, so I realized it's not so easy for, for yeah. the people We're to take the time, but it's, well, it's great for the ones that are there, so that's what counts. No, thank you. Where's Enos? I see Arthur is on. Arthur, where's Enos? Enos is there uh, with the blue shirt. Where? Hold on. She's not showing up on my computer. <laughs> Hi, Enos. Where? Oh, there you are. Okay. Nice to see you. How's Paz Bali? Well, it's, it's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. As long as you wear a mask on the bike, everything's fine. You know? yeah. I'm way overdue a trip. I'm trying to get back before Christmas. So. Oh, really? Cool. That's good. For vacation? Family vacation or for work? Yes, I want to stay for like a month. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's good so Liza you want to start now yeah okay all right uh before everything I would like to thank all of you all for having to for having joined this talk uh, albeit it happened on a Friday night It's supposed to be like a party night but like socially distanced party so uh, my name is Lisa Marcus I'm from ISA art and design we are a gallery at South Jakarta Quite a new gallery but uh, we have been in the arts for a long time and um, in our in our roster we try to champion uh, female artists and um, we are really aware of this the existence of uh, other more alternative Indonesian narrative outside of uh, what is usually represented as Indonesian therefore we open um, this exhibition um, Buah Tangan, which is also part of the Art Jakarta Virtual um, Exhibition, uh, Art Jakarta Virtual uh, Program, um, with um, a group exhibition by diaspora, in the Indonesian diaspora artists. Uh, but this is in, this is uh, at the same time remembering that we are also including uh, people from both historical Indonesian diaspora such as Hadesa that um, whose fa uh, family emigrated from Indonesia like quite some time ago like in the 1950s I believe and um, Indonesian diaspora person from more recent let's say professional diaspora like like Ines so we can have this nuanced and um, nuanced understanding of what an Indonesian diaspora narrative really is uh, from this multiple perspective. Yeah. All right. Um, so um, in our exhibition, we are really, um, we really focus on discussing the narrative of displacement, alienation, and also the diaspora experience. Uh, maybe we can ask the artists to introduce themselves first briefly. Uh, maybe starting with Hadesa. Hadesa, can you? Introduce okay. yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hadassah Emrich. I'm um, a Dutch artist, so born and raised in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands. And at the moment, I live and work in Brussels since for the last five years. Um, but I've also um, studied in London for a few years. I've lived in Antwerp and in Berlin. So I've been a bit around Europe uh, to, to see what the, the art is like and um, done different educate, gone through different kinds of art education. So that's maybe a bit about me. My pr practice is painting based. Um, also, I do murals. I uh, had a big commission uh, last year in the Dutch, uh, no, I should say Netherlands Embassy in Jakarta. That's what's brought us to also meet. So uh, it's fantastic to, to make that connection through, through work with, with Indonesia. You are actually, um, you have actually done two murals in Indonesia, right? Back in, I think, 2006, and another one was in 2019, I guess. That's correct, yes. Yeah, it's an, an incredible kind of um, opportunity, in fact, that, that I was offered already then, and I thought it would never come back, something like that, and then it actually <laughs> did. <laughs> so um, this was uh, incredible to actually go back and, and extend, expand the existing mural. 
that was there. How about you, Ines? How are you? Oh, good, thanks. Um, hello, my name is Ines Gatamso. Ines, you are quite soft. Can you like speak nearer to the mic? Can you hear me better? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, I'm Ines Gatamso. Uh, I'm half French, half Indonesian. Um, I was born in Yogyakarta. So my father is the Indonesian side and my mom the French one. Um, I was raised in Jogja and then at 10 I moved to France where I studied um, textile fashion and then since um, three years now I started to paint and do more personal works. I also have a studio design, uh, a design studio. Um, it's Atelier Sony, and <clears throat> we do mostly um, um, murals and uh, visual projects. So, which is more graphic, also fashion design, but mostly mural and artwork. So, yeah, that's it. I think. And yeah, I'm based in Bali, I, I forgot to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for the introduction by both of y'all. Um, I think I would like to start the, the question because we started this discussion with like your mural, Hadassa, uh, with you first came to Indonesia in the 90s as an art student, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. But Indeed. back in the Netherlands, you were surrounded by um, this Indo-Dutch culture as well with like all the Pasar Malams and like your performances as a dancer back then. Uh, can you tell us how different do you find the Indo-Dutch culture that is already adapted and reimagined in the Netherlands as compared to the, to the actual Indonesian culture that you experience in Indonesia? How, how does the experience go for you? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a complex question actually, because of course it's, it's very subjective. Like the, the say that the Indo-Dutch experience that I had came through my father's side and his, his mother, my grandmother. Um, and then indeed, let's say culturally, there were these Pasar Malams and the dancing. I then I have to explain, I started also joining, I joined an amateur Hawaiian dance group when I was 15. And these kind of groups would usually perform at these Pasar Malams, which are like sort of um, temporary fairs that, that come to town like a circus, let's say. So they, they're there for a weekend and you can visit and eat um, Indonesian food or rice tafel or um sort of have this sort of experience as if you would be in indonesia i guess but i didn't know any better at the time what's what's what you know it's it's it was already very um influenced just by of course movies or books i'd read i was reading also marion bloom uh, for for secondary schools so of course i had had an idea of what it could be then in the same time, I have to say my personal experience maybe came rather from my curiosity came almost rather from absence than presence because um, my dad didn't really, so let's say, educate me uh, historically or um, also he couldn't perhaps. He was a child when he left Indonesia. He was only six. His brothers were much older, but they lived in another part of the country. So I wouldn't really be able to talk to them about it. Um, so I really had to go and find out for myself in a way. And I, and I really wanted to. I was very curious in my early 20s to, to go. And I, I organized it sort of very improvised with finding a teacher and writing letters and waiting for the response. And then I just rem remember arriving on the airport and it was a real shock already. The, the humidity, the smell, the the amounts of people everywhere it was nothing like I had ever imagined. <laughs> you know, so it was really, really amazing to suddenly I was really overwhelmed. And I lived in a guest family with, with three, um, you know, kids my age. So was that say they were also studying, but they still lived at home. I already lived by myself. So there were these big 
cultural differences of of also um, you know what you do as a young student what time you're home um, just all these things suddenly I was confronted with, with in all levels which was really really interesting not easy you know it wasn't an easy just wondrous trip it was quite confronting to be actually there all by myself you know but I, I, I had wanted it and I got it so it, it was good <laughs> But it's very hard to really specifically locate the differences. It's, it's very difficult. You could say, you know, it's a bit like entering a theater stage in the Netherlands. If you go to these fairs, it's all staged. It's all happy music, nice food, nice smells, dancers. It's, it's just a sort of the, you know, a perfume, let's say, <laughs> of, of what it could be. I don't know if that would answer the question a little bit, but <laughs> I don't want to elaborate too much because we don't have that much time, of course. I could talk about it for a long time, but I will leave space as well. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember actually like this discussion that you say it's a, it's a staged and perfumed experience. Um, actually, it happens in Indonesia as well. We are some in some part and some subculture we are quite fixated with that sweetened and saccharine past i remember mm -hmm. that in a phone call we had a discussion about the saccharine nature mm -hmm. of nostalgia and mm -hmm. in which you expressed to me that your batik babe your older series batik babe series was a reaction against it can you elaborate more about how your batik babe series is going against that saccharine nature and um, maybe you tell more about your Batik Babe series for the audiences that mm -hmm. are not really familiar with it. Yes, I think uh, rather than a series, it, it was kind of an alter ego or a persona that I created sort of in the early 2000s. Ah um, oh yeah, that's an, that's an old work. Yeah, true. So um, it, it came actually gradually and very carefully. I wasn't immediately bold and out there with it. it. I had to get used to it myself. Like I almost needed another persona enable to be, that would allow me to speak about this theme and the, my attraction to, to my quest, as it were, for, for this other Asian or Eurasian identity or also an artistic identity that, that drove me to these places. And I, I had to almost create another persona that would allow me to do this very boldly rather than with too many doubts or am I entitled to, am I not entitled to, you know, so I needed this other figure that became Batik Babe. And under her kind of authority or, or name, let's say, I was able to do these very bold murals and um, reference very specific and direct um, uh, yeah like the Baltic heart um, I used images from National Geographic it was all about appropriation so it was it came together with a with an artistic strategy let's say to talk about this theme um, that was very bold it was very in the here and now had a bit relation to street art to um, um, a very sort of uh, was a, a Eurasian woman, you know, so with 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 a business instinct, with no not hindered by let's say emotional blocks, you know. I really created this persona that I was like, she's got to be fast, she's got to get to the point, she's sharp with it, you know. So I was really about, and that grew over a few years um, into using this person in the titles of my show. Let's say that 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 I found was very exciting and also dosed with humor for me you know I had to be still um, giving the audience also a way to get curious to get triggered to to want to come and see it so that was Batik Babe um, and then what was the other part of the question um, how does it go with the with your statement as um, how should I phrase it it's you are problematizing this this sweet uh, yeah, nature, definitely. yeah. How how yeah. does it react to that? Is it the the over loudness of it became almost like like a cynical commentary towards it? But at the same time, it's exposing the problem but aestheticizing the problem at the same time. 
Is that around, around what you are doing? Yeah, I think it's true in a way by sort of blowing up the stereotypes, um, the exotic dancers, the calendar girls, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the tourist ads and, and it, it helped me to really then, um, you know, address this theme, these, these themes and the problems of these themes, which indeed, as you said, it is sugared, but then I sugared it even more, you know, it was even blown up to an extent that you, that it's too sweet, you know, it's clear that it's um, meant to be like that, like deliberately exaggerated and indeed pull it away from this nostalgic, um, sentimental, sentimental journey kind of feeling, which was very uh, appropriate, like very deliberate for me at the time. Yeah, I think that's, that's a strategy, isn't that? Like, rather than countering something by going against it, you are making it, pulling it into an extreme so that the, it is the problem within it became accentuated um, mm -hmm. naturally. It, it, it synthesized in the mind of the audiences that there is something that is not quite right with this kind of vision. It's something that is fantastical, but at the same time kind of, should I say kitschy? Like, it's, it's a kitsch yeah. in, a, in a way or another. True, I was interested in that, and the abundance, you know, the overlayering on top. So there was this, these jungle-like paintings that sort of, yeah, all these lianas and, and intricate nets of, of possible meaning that, that I was interested in, in presenting in, in regards to that, to that theme. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, Bu Clara, Bu Carla is here. Okay. Um, on that also, your current painting looks aesthetically very, very much different than the Batik Babes. There's still the element of the, those colors, like very loud, very overly tropical, overly like exotic color, but the form has transformed so much. How, how, what, what was the turning point? And how does the two carry the same message, but yet mm -hmm. the output is very different visually. True, it's, it's, of course it's happened over a longer period of time, it wasn't overnight. Um, I think this period of, of Batik Babe slowly came to maybe, an, an, I wouldn't call it an end, but it started to shift perhaps towards 2008, 2009, 2010. Well, I think also the, the, the time change, you know, we had the crisis, I was living in Berlin, um, things were more gray, uh, subdued. Um, I think I, what I said, I started to have a need for introspection about everything. Um, it kind of, I think the constant taking and putting into your soup, you know, the appropriation. At one point, let's say the sponge was kind of full, perhaps, you know, where I was I started to 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 want to speak from the inside out rather than keeping layering external things into into my vocabulary. I became almost curious about this other internalized uh, where, where it could come out from an internalized point of view and then expand back from there. So that was a very slow and long process that I had to just work with. I couldn't I couldn't stop it. I couldn't do more mo monster murals, you know, as I called them later. There was sort of monstrous like almost eating me up at one point like um physically so i think this physical element remained in very important also in how i make these new works what they deal with what they represent as image also the body the female body um labor you know it's still all all in there the labor of making so for me it's actually quite going back to new work to Baltic Babe in a really different way. There's been another period in between that was more muted. I think now I'm really in a, in a, in a well-balanced, if you can call it like that, uh, point of the work where I'm more in control of, of working with my energy, also with the murals. I can work better with assistants. Like at the time I would just sort of blow everything, blow the candle, you know, like burn the candle on two sides. I just couldn't even I, I didn't even think about it, you know, I just gave it all and then wondered why I stood there with empty hands at the end or something, <laughs> you know, so it was a very existential process. 
So um, I, can, I can probably explain it like that, both with an introspection and of course an intellectual curiosity of, of how I can approach this theme without being overly appropriating stuff all the time. So that's really where, where it came from. I remember you told me that this, this turning point happened around during your residency in Curaçao. Oh, uh, that's when I really could come out with the first works that were made like this, that really addressed the, the thematics again in a way that was bold and direct and, and layered in the same time. It's true. So that was 2000, end of 2014, just before we moved to Brussels, where I felt I finally had a grip on, on a new way of working that, that would, that completely satisfied all the, um, you know, I could tick almost all the boxes of my own, um, yeah, uh, how do you say it? Yeah, what I needed to be in, in, in a successful artwork. You know, you have your own list of, of what it should, should do. And I think then I finally managed to, to, to sort of break through that. So that's, let's say, then indeed five years ago. So it took some time. <laughs> of course, and the result was, was great. Um, I'm jumping a little bit in this. Um, Hadassah is not the only artist here that, that turn their practice around quite drastically, but yet still carry the same theme. Um, sorry, I just jumped to you out of nowhere, no. but uh, I remember cool. that the motives of uh, plants has always been in your artwork before it, is, it, is, it, it has become this body of work the canvas splicing. Can you tell me more how does it carry from, from the floral motif depiction and how does it translate into your current series and your investigation towards the cellular structure or like atomic structure in this, in this current series? Um, yeah, my main concept uh, has always been to work around the notion of life and my relation to it. And as I live in Bali and I'm like surrounded by plants, uh, on on that previous uh, series where I, I paint plants, I just wanted to talk about my connection to nature. So I painted naturally like tropi tropical plants where I evolve. In fact, I mean like. Here in Bali, the garden is big, like humidity is really high, so it's just like green everywhere. And, um, and I'm like, I was really in love with those intricate and organic shapes and shades that you can see through the leaves. I, I was just obsessed about it and I wanted to paint it. And there's always character behind the plan and it could be me or anyone else, but it's just talking about this um yeah connection that we do have with a nature and that we tend to forget like more and more now i feel so yeah and then um, i got bored <laughs> and i had to move on and i started to explore um more into the scientific side of life and then I study a lot biology, astrobiology, and some like a little bit of quantum physics. <laughs> and, uh, and I discovered like something even more amazing, you know, to work with. So, so yeah, I'm starting a journey like into biology and astrobiology. And I think it's like a long path and it's really worth it. I mean, like, I'm really happy about where I go now. So yeah. Uh, I think there is there is this very nice like micro macro scale going on between between Hadassah's work and uh, Ines, where both talks about displacement and alienation. Uh, whereas in uh, Hadassah's work, it's about the female exotic and erotic displacement experience, but Whereas in Ines' artwork, it is much more general. Why is it very important for Ines, you, to highlight the alienation of human from, in this modern world, from their natural, I mean, 
from our like what's how to say it in, in english oh my god um how does it yeah our, our natural origin <laughs> um my work is not really a direct criticism against uh alienation or like uh, our behavior in this uh, modern society but it's just uh, like a remain my work like especially this the new series like this one is um more like a reminder about what we are you know it's like what we are not in our personality or sensitivity or spirituality is like not about what makes us special as a, an individual and uh, someone but it's more about what we are made of like our composition you know like our structure and it what makes us a living being you know so and I feel now with uh, social media, we always try to be uh, someone else, someone like to be special and always trying to create something new, you, you know what I mean. And um, I feel we tend to forget about what we are made of, like just this complex organization and, and um, yeah, composition of, tiny thing that we don't even we don't even how to say that we are not aware of and that we don't even sense it like we have like many organisms living in and on our body and then we are basically just an ecosystem you know on ourselves and i think it's great to remember of this point you know, so it's, yeah, the painting are just a, remi a reminder that we are made of billions of cells and that we have more neurons in our, in our brain than, than stars in galaxy, which is like, you know, like it's mind blowing, like, and yeah, I think like, I think it's Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, he's like the writer, uh, author of Little Prince, you know, like this famous book. Yeah, he, to, he always say like the Asian essential. Sorry for my English. The essential is invisible to our eye, to our eyes. So yeah, I think that's it. It's, yeah, my painting are just like to remind us. Yeah. Is it the reason behind why you paint these cells so no. big, bigger than life size? Is it um, the, this exchange of what's big becomes small, what's small becomes big? Um, yeah, I wanted to explode the scale because and bring the micro uh, that we can see into macro, so our scale, but even bigger than human, you know. But my painting, some of them are like around two meters. And uh, by blowing the scale, it's just like, again, the, to remind like the importance of cells and uh, all these elementary particles that we are made of and that what surround us. And uh, yeah, cells is basically the block of light. And, and yeah, I think that's why I wanted to just make it like way bigger than that the yeah that the size of the a cell in fact and scale is is one of the best thing I, I guess uh, to think about in science you know like I love thinking about scale and as much as I love thinking about nothingness or nil you know thinking about the scale you know of a uh, elementary particle like quark compared to atom compared to cell to cell compared to our cell earth stars black hole galaxy blah 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 it's just like it's one of the best thing to to dream about you know it's like the perfect subject you know so yeah i wanted to blow the scale <laughs> i think other than just the scale um your move from your previous series to this current series came with the shift of medium your medium now become part of your concept 
because you are pushing your material to be more and more sustainable, how yeah. is your process in discovering these new mediums and what are the struggles in like sourcing for medium that will speak and will support your concept? Yeah, I so I changed from my previous series, I changed the the subject but also the medium as you just said. So I, I used to paint with oil painting and uh, it, it requires so much gesso and medium and white spirit and turpentine and mm, my studio was so toxic and because I have asthma it was really hard to to handle the to open the windows and the door at the same time like not to inhale the all the vape and also by throwing all this chemical product into the sink make me sick because you know like indonesia or bali waste situation or water quantity quality i didn't want to make it worse you know so so yeah i just decided to be more careful about what i use um to make my art so now I basically work with gouache, uh, watercolor and ink on raw cotton. And now I play with paper. That's a new thing now. And the frames, as you can see on the picture, it's made from recycled plastic. So Balinese waste, the plastic. And then, yeah, we mold it and make the shape and yeah. So it ended up like as a frame, and uh, yeah. So now I'm yeah I'm more careful with what I use. But yeah, it was really hard to change from oil to water-based painting because it's completely the opposite, you know. So I think it took me like almost a year, you know, to get used to it. But I like the results, so all good. And also the water is um, is the element where uh, life appears 3.5 billion years ago. So I think it's cool. <laughs> it goes to the subject. <laughs> yes, of course. It's it's the best when like the medium supports the subject or like yeah. the medium doesn't jeopardize the subject. Yeah, yeah. What's sure. interesting also is your your subversion of painting surface rather than treating canvas as a surface you treat it as a medium itself how does it work with your concept um i like to um sometimes no sometimes i like to blur uh, the lines and um and uh, yeah, as you can see on my artwork, it's, it's not just a painting, it's, it's a bit hard to explain, but it, it could be like a relief, we can say that in English, you know, like this type of 3D painting. And uh, the process was just, wasn't just to apply paint on the surface but also working with the matter of the painting itself, which is canvas here. And uh, yes, yeah, so I was, yeah, I was playing with the matter. This one you can, as you can see, like, we cannot really see it, but there's two painting becoming one, in fact. But do you want me to go painting by painting or just, no, it's all right. Just, just, just discuss about the method. Um, but like talking about blurring the lines, um, I like also um, to play with the um, look of the painting. Um, it could be also confusing because we think it's abstract, you know, like my last work. But except it's it's. it's actually very figurative because I, I reinterpreted what I see through a microscope. It's just like tiny organism, like cells. But yeah, at the first sight, we could see, we could think it's abstract, but not really in fact. 
<laughs> yeah, so like blurring the blurring the boundary between like painting and sculpture, between textile art and uh and like a, just just a painting, uh just like decompartmentalizing yeah. the genre of art. Um I think that speaks a lot about your what you see your identity as as well, because previously you say, Oh, you don't like to be you don't like to be classified into into Frenchness or Indonesianness, yeah. but rather to be like just this human, like what you say in your painting, just this composition of cells, yeah. like as a being. I think that's a very nice way to look at to look at um, our ownership of the land, our our nationality, because it it will always be when when we think about nationalism when we talk about cultural identity there will always be this gray spot where things melt together and that this in between cultures in between narrative needs to be highlighted more because what is accepted by us what is propagated in the society is this very compartmentalized very squared of understanding of our citizenship in this world globally or in asia southeast asia and other regions of the world. Um, I think I want to go back to um, Hadessa. Um, just like Ines, like your Ines medium and art making process becomes part of the becomes part of the the concept itself. Become part of the meaning itself. Um, Hadessa, how do you see the printing process? Um, is does does the act of printing because now you print your your paintings? Um, how does it alludes to any concept or meaning that you want to express in your work? How does the process of uh, the act of printing um, supports your your concept? Um, yeah, I've I've used also printmaking in my older work, but there was really a way to reference. Uh, for example, primitivist art or paintings of Gauguin. Um, because of this, I would also actually lose, use lino cut or wood cut directly, so in a more traditional way and how it looked. And then gradually, the, the printmaking has become, for me, an autonomous uh, way of, of painting. Like now, it really, for me, addresses problematics of painting, um, such as the, the gesture, for example. Uh, my, my painting gesture is, is basically really um, almost denied in this, in this process of printing. Uh, so you don't see really any brushwork or any brushwork that could reveal my, um, uh, my, my temperament, let's say, as it would usually do. So I'm, I'm purposefully using this also to, to also, it, it helps me to construct the image and the composition much, much clearer. Like I don't sort of uh, drown in, this, in my own endless way of, of brushing, brushing away, which was never really my thing anyway. So it, it's not about that in my work, about my supposed uh, virtuosity, let's say. So this, this printmaking aspect allows me to really talk about aspects of, of crucial to painting for me. Also about the, um, uh, you know, the, the frame, how to, how to crop, um, where where the image goes out of the of the of the frame, or of, of course the aspect of repetition. Like I can basically repeat my motives um, and test different variations of the same motive. So it, it allows me to be more investigative in my in my color um, color exploration and and how this um, comes about when you put these images then these paintings next to each other. Like you can really then. And in that same way, it goes back to the thematics of, of a commodification, of offering this idea of, of variety to the customer, you know, like in, in capitalist uh, society, like we love these vitrines where you want the blue or the red or the green or the purple or, you know, so in a way I'm, I'm playing upon this with, this with this technique. It really allows me to explore it more in depth and also in the same time breed my own species, you know, like keep working till I, I get 
unexpected color combinations while while sticking with the motif. So it's for me, it's really sort of coming home. This this technique, this yeah, this technology of of printing, in painting. Like I, I don't see myself as a printmaker in the end. I really see this, especially more than before. I see myself as a painter. Funnily enough, it had to be through this way. So yeah, yeah. Other than just bringing bringing up the element of slight variation your usage of stencil bring, really brings up this element of slight variation uh mm -hmm. and your 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 concept of commodification and whatnot of like the the female or the exotic bodies um this template mm -hmm. also create this aesthetic of like human body that is essentially essentialized human body that's essentialized into um into cylindrical very volumetric geometric shapes mm -hmm. and sometimes it reminds me of like even like cubist or even futurist because of the repetition or pop artworks are you influenced by any of this movement in any way and what are the reason that these bodies become so simplified, so industrialized in mm -hmm. its looks. Yeah, no, definitely. I think anyway, my um, old work also found an entry through the use of popular culture or let's say pop art also. Um, let's say with the calendar girls and, um, you know, the National Geographic and the, the big exploded heart shape. So there was always that aspect present in the work which I feel now is indeed more internalized. The pop art is still in a very important exhibition I saw in 2014 in Tate Modern, uh, The World Goes Pop, was for me extremely important to see because uh, it showed a lot of um, pop art we had never seen. We only know knowing it as the American pop art, but it showed pop art from even the Eastern Bloc, things I'd never knew were there. And it also a lot from, from female artists that had never been recognized and actually used pop art as a way to address um, domestic issues or domestic violence or repression in all sorts of ways. So pop art was never, I learned a lot through that exhibition. It was never the pop art as we know it superficially, the American sort of celebration of consumer culture or, or critic, critic um, criticizing it, there's so much more to it. Yeah, like like Kiki Kogelnik, for example. Um, so it was a huge revelation for me to see that, and it really showed me I need to. I'm very interested to keep addressing my my interests and themes through this through this way. And then, indeed, I think the cubist cubist way of working has also been very interesting because it allows for this multifaceted uh, way of bringing different truths together in the same picture plane in the same time. So you can actually play out different realities and angles, which I think conceptually is still very interesting for, for now, especially now perhaps. And indeed the futurists, yeah, of course we know it as this um, sort of very male, macho, very sort of, um, you know, uh, celebrating industrialization. Uh, machines, metal, shine, speed, you know, all these sort of things we would, would sort of stereotypically address to male characteristics. I think it's definitely interesting to, to readdress this through a female perspective. But I think out of the three, it's for me, of course, there's, there's someone like Leger who, who also has been very important for me as a, quoting his, his female figures like the hair in, in the Leger paintings, Jeanne Leger, are always almost the same. Like they have this sort of, it's like a strip of dark with a few highlights in it. So I've, I've purposefully at one point used that way of, of hairdo in, in Cold Shoulder series, for example. But then my highlights are more like tube lights, you know, they're exaggerated. So there's that, that referencing is still in the work, but it's more subtle than, than it was before in, in, the, in the Batik Babe time. So here you can see yeah, those, it's almost more, more stylized and indeed abstracted. But you can still detect the, the repetition of these hair, hairdos, let's say. So that, that's all still in there, these references. I think it's important to, 
to keep keep playing with these because they, they do allow historical lines and, and shift meaning can bring new meaning, refresh meaning. So it's definitely important purposefully. I really like your statement about how how pop in the West, pop in America is is a celebration or something, or like that that futurism is something that is very masculine. Because uh, us in I think that is very reflective to the to the experience of diaspora itself. Um, is the dissemination of knowledge, is the dissemination of conventions. Because in Indonesia we receive all of this western stylistic non canonically back then like maybe in in the west where it originates there is a reason behind why this style came about why this style came about after that style but in indonesia we are receiving it almost as an imported product or like a ready made and it will be it's something that's alien in a sense and something that is alien sometimes are intrusive um mm -hmm. and if if intrusive is too much of a strong word, it's 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 odd. It's it's jarring, um, and it will be always interesting to see what sorts of the tournament take place. What kind of like creolization that happens to this art movement? How mm -hmm. art movements such as Bauhaus, Futurism, Cubism, is made sense in. Indonesia, how Indonesian artists made sense of it through its own meaning and therefore made it themselves, turn, turn it against its own head. If, if, yeah. if I would like to say it in a more radical manner and, and that, that's the same goes with like diaspora culture. It's culture that is foreign, it's always alien and unwelcome, but in this sense, there's two alien not here nor their culture and the the resulting synthesis culture place together the the two very different culture just like all of this movement is then detoured into is then given a new meaning through its journey to other places of the world through its dispersion yeah <laughs> tangential <laughs> speaking <laughs> Yeah, no, but it differs highly from, let's say, a postmodern approach where where everything has the same value. Like it's completely different from from what you're describing, and I think that's where it can get confusing, because it's it's indeed I, I agree very much with you. I feel also that my work in in the bottom line has always been about this idea of creolization and mixing, and I'm sort of almost celebrating this you know, shamelessly to say, well, this is what, what I got to be. And now I have to, I can only almost make work from this perspective in the end. But in the beginning, as a young artist, it was very, you know, like, oh, how do I talk about this? How do you visualize these, this, this idea or this identity or these feelings or smells? Like, it's very hard to get to a, so you have to almost work with uh, specific references to, to sort of, build this up carefully and then start to weigh what these mean and so it's a different it's a different approach than just pick and mix and think everything's at your disposal you know it's a very different uh, approach that's uh, yeah very crucial i'm also very interested in the way you display your stencil like the tool of making your artwork became a an object, an independent object in itself. Why, why do you display it in such way? And, and what was the reason behind like your usage of final both as a tool and as a body of work? Yeah, there's, there's different reasons. Um, so what, what I, I use floor vinyl to, to make these templates. So I usually order a big roll of floor vinyl, um, like 10 by four meters, and then I can cut big shapes, small shapes, um, and at one point these shapes started to, you know, pile up in the studio and, and they got a life of their own. Like I, the bigger shapes, I, I never throw away. And in a way it's interesting to relate to, to Ines 
because it's it becomes a side product that that lost um, its function and it, it could be trashed let's say but then I, I really didn't want to trash these shapes because of course it, it's such a pity and I, I really wanted to give them another life as autonomous presences because that's just what they have even beyond me or my ideas so um, I really thought they have to be integrated even as real skins you know they almost look like fake leather or leather skins that that have been shed off and I thought that aspect is so relevant to to what I do in the end that I have to collect them and, and see how they can get a presence in, in an exhibition but um, admittedly it's not always easy to to see how they fit in what their role can be rather than just this kind of display of, of them um, so I'm, I'm still I'm still that's an ongoing parallel investigation to think of, of really constructive and conceptual ways of how to integrate them in the, in the work. I, I wish I can, I can get this work in Jakarta, Hadesa, for the next shows. <laughs> I really, really like it. Great, thanks. Um, Ines, um, maybe last question for you. I'm really interested in the way your series sort of morph from the morphogenesis to the synthesis series to the last one that you sent us, the binary fission, there's this sort of like, I think I might wrong to call it transformation, but it really seems like a transformation. Like in the morphogenesis, there is no canvas splicing, or at least there's not yet canvas splicing. And then there's in this synthesis, there's synthesis series, there's this very strong usage of canvas uh, splicing and stitching together and then in the binary vision the canvas folding and stitching and splicing acquire this symmetrical form why 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 are what's what's the reason behind this development is it like a linear development or you are working on the series simultaneously at the same time and it just so happened to acquire different kind of shapes it was a proper evolution, like um, I started with morphogenesis, the, the more simple one. Um, it's, it's basically like just um, a study of, um, of cells again, of what I could see uh, with a microscope and uh, the splash of painting it it's um it's my reinterpretation like what i could see like through the lens is some blurred shapes and shades that look so fragile but so essential to our life and we don't really understand we don't really understand it like 100 percent so like the technique when i pen i don't really control it you know like how the fusion goes like with the blob of paint i soak the fabric with water i drip some paint or I apply paint like randomly and then it goes where wherever it has to it like it evolves you know like the painting are spreading by itself so it's kind of like an evolution and it goes, I mean, like the result is really organic. And for the synthesis one, it gets like a bit more complex. It's, um, it's two paintings becoming one. Synthesis is, um, is how the is in constant evolution. And uh, how nothing is lost nothing is created like and everything is transformed it's like two paintings becoming one and and yeah so we kind of like lose the identity of the the background painting and the first painting so it's becoming like um another identity like you know like something else and it's 
how matter evolves. In fact, even like when we die, like our atom is still exists. You know, we don't, we are not here anymore, but our um, elementary particles still exist and, and go somewhere else and becoming somewhere, something else. It's just like in constant evolution, in constant transformation. So yeah, I wanted to play with several painting and trying to play with it and trying to make something, you know, maybe more 3D for this one. And binary fission is, um, is a chemic, um, is basically a chemical, it's the name of the um, um, dividing cells. In fact, when a cell divides itself to, to make a new cell. So it's like the main action of origin of life, you know, like without this action, nothing will live, at least on earth, outside, I don't know, but on earth it's like that. And <laughs> so during the process of division, uh, it, the cell becoming like a perfect uh, symmetry, symmetry, symmetry. And uh, it's what I wanted to express uh, into this artwork. So again, like two painting, maybe becoming something else. And, and yeah, um, and what is really geometrical, this one to maybe make a contrast with the blob of painting, but it has also this et ethnic, ethnical vibe on the results um yeah uh why is it geometrical i don't know <laughs> it's okay it's a constant uh you know, discovery like, sometimes it's, it when i look at it it like it reminds me like you know i studied textile and fashion and and you know like all the pattern we do to make our uh our uh clothes it's it's kind of similar. Like I mean, like playing with canvas, it it's like going back into my uh, my love with textile, you know. So when I play with it, um, maybe I went too far in the past, and I was like, <laughs> you know, going with the scissors and like let's see how it goes, and then some reflex like comes in, um, yeah. But yeah, that's it, I think. I think it's very interesting. It acquired because like the symmetry, how you fold, you cut the painting on one side and then fold it to the other side. It, uh, it's, it's, if it's really hard to explain. It, can you put the picture? Can, can, can. So, well, yeah. So the, in fact, there's two paintings. There's like the really like, uh, like, monochrome of blue kind of and one is like really colorful so the colorful one is the first is the background you know that we can see and the blue i cut it and i flip it on the other side so you can see the symmetry in fact i, I think everyone is last but uh, yeah <laughs> so in fact just cut it and flip it on the background yeah, you can see the flipping here, like there's the folded. Yeah, yeah. I think humans always have the tendency to to associate something into something that is recognizable. Like, yeah, it looks like a house to me. Like, it's called apophenia. Sorry, what? Apophenia is, uh, I think, how our brain tend to find uh, some figurative uh, shapes into maybe abstract. Uh, I think it's called apophenia. Yeah. Yeah, like like the clouds in the sky or like the yeah. rose arch blood in blood test. Yeah. You know, we can we can derive a lot of meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. So uh, now I think it's seven. I want to open the floor. If there is any question, you can just un unmute your mic one by one and ask the question to the artist and then the artist will answer your question or alternatively, if you want to stay silent, you can. 
type it in the chat and I will read it out to you. So anything from the floor? Any comments for Carla or Bumlani or Dev? Do you have any comments? No? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Hadassa. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello, Carla. Wonderful you're here. Great. Nice to see you. Nice How are you? you? Good. Thank you. How are you? Okay. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I can't see your paintings too well because I'm looking from my handphone. It is very small. But I, of course, I remember something from some time ago and there is some similarity, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we met um, uh, back... At the Erasmus House. Yes, yes. So we've, we've met already in 2006 and then again uh, last summer, right, in Jakarta. Yes, yes. And even, yes, so um, yeah, it was fantastic because uh, Ibu Carla also, uh, we, the book, you showed the book about the Indonesian women artists and um, it was really great to, to have this other exchange. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember you even wrote an article in 2006, right, about the mural yeah the, i think so but do you have that article i don't have it I, I also unfortunately don't think i have been able to retrieve it so far i've been looking for it as well but yeah it's unfortunate yeah. yes but i remember you of course fantastic yeah so when right. are you coming again <laughs> let's hope very very soon <laughs> it's a plan i love to also visit ines and uh, you know it would be wonderful see you again mm -hmm. I'm very grateful. Maybe I want to just express my, my gratefulness for this, this uh, opportunity uh, to, to ESA Art Gallery and to, it's for me, it's, it's truly wonderful as, as I explained a bit my journey through the years with, with Indonesia and, and see how I could connect to, to it as a person, as an artist. Um, I think this is really for me, uh, yeah, I'm so, it, it fills me with, with uh, true joy. I have to say to be able to connect to, with with all of you and to also make people here more aware and and you know show how how this kind of journey can can visualize and connect with other other stories so i think i, I would like to say that perhaps as a as a conclusion <laughs> from my side for now so yeah yes so see you again when we see each other. <laughs> Definitely. Take, take good care. Yes. You do. I, I would like to, um, to say something and to ask something as well to uh, Hadassah. I'm Yolanda. I'm the director of Erasmus House. Great so day. I would... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe I can help you, uh, Hadassah and Carla, to find the article because I'm interested as well in this. Maybe it's somewhere in the archives of the embassy. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. True. I was wondering, I was uh, listening to your stories. Thank you so much. Also to Ines, because it's really nice to talk about um, how you work. And uh, I really love both your work. So I um, was at the uh, ISA Art uh, um, Gallery this afternoon to see the, um, the paintings in real, because it's always very different from from seeing them on the website of course and i was really yeah I was so it made me so happy to go out again and to see paintings i was just listening to you too to hadas and ines and ines is very concerned with um nature um environment she uses the frames for her works uh, using plastic bottles and i was wondering hadasa is that one of your concerns as well to to yeah, to 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 um, use environmental. Um, how do you call it? To not because it's 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 quite it's quite an issue nowadays. And using, of course, we know that painting and all kind of arts are also very polluting. Can be also very polluting. Is it is it 
is it in your mind is it is it do you work with with these kind of ideas to to change your way of working or yeah i have been thinking about it definitely i think the the good thing about this technique i'm using it's still oil it's oil paint but the good thing is i i basically can't don't need um mediums for this technique so i, I use the pure paint as it comes from uh, the, the consistency i don't need to water it down so like good turpentine so i don't really use these kind of of uh, mediums so that's one good thing so i don't need to put it through the sink as well <laughs> so and then in, again what i said with the templates i try to really give them a second life as much as i can so i'm definitely also thinking from that perspective but yeah to get the color intensity that that i want i i I think for now I will have to stick to the oil, to this particular oil even that I found a few years ago that I'm really, really in love with. So it's it's difficult to renounce to that, I, I would have to say, for, you know. Is this also, time. because I don't know, is this oil paint also the same you used in, our, in the murals in our embassy? Uh, that's printing ink, but also there oh, yeah. I've used um, uh, sort of water soluble type that doesn't the odor doesn't spread so it's also not the old-fashioned one that's actually quite toxic you know so yeah. this is already a better version but it's still not water-based because it would simply not especially for a, a commission it wouldn't have that, that fixed quality right. Like, right. so it's, uh, definitely different concerns have to come together but yeah. definitely think about it definitely you see it more and more now these days and yeah and, yeah. and i'm not blaming you uh, mind you because of course i'm i'm driving in my car car through jakarta so i'm i'm to blame as much as, as everybody else but i was just every wondering little, if it crossed your mind helps, right every little concern puts in something yeah. that's yeah. how i see it yeah yeah <laughs> and i want to thank you that i am able to work within your paintings, it's such a bless. It's such a bless. Wonderful to hear. It makes me super happy. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming here to the too. Yeah, great. Any more comments from the floor? Okay, um, so I would like to to uh, um, before we conclude this talk, I would like to invite all of you to our virtual space. This this exhibition is part of the Art Jakarta Virtual 2020. Uh, thank you, Tom, for coming to this talk as well, and also Team Yvonne Fiesta. Um, uh, so you can access it at artjakarta.com. Uh, it will be on until I think until the 14th of this. What month is this? Of November. November. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, if you are in Jakarta, you can schedule an uh, individual socially distance visit uh, to us. And thank you again, everyone, for having um, listened to this artist talk and joined into this artist talk, this one hour plus long artist talk on a Friday night. and. Um, I guess, hello Tom, hi. <laughs> yeah, anything, Buddha Buddha? Yeah, no, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone because yes, it's a Friday night and Enos, it's eight o'clock in Bali. Uh, so you're almost finished. But we so appreciate you joining us and um, learning more about the practices of Enos and Hadessa. We've been working with them for a few years now and so excited about their practice as well as I see Ida Lawrence has joined us today so thank you Ida. Uh, Ida is also in the uh, Buatangan show and uh, Dr. Milani, Carla, everyone. Yolanda it was great to see you at the gallery today so please stop by like you said we're, we're there Monday to Friday weekends by appointment but uh, everybody have a wonderful weekend and we so enjoyed seeing you and hearing hearing from the artists from Hadessa and Enos. Thank you. Thank thank you, you. So much, have a great Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.